And speaking of frequent guests, our guest in this segment is Steve Williams. He's been on the show many times since we suspected he might run for governor and then ultimately decided to run for governor as the Democratic nominee. Steve's been jet-setting around at least half the country over the last week. Steve, good morning to you. Good morning. Glad to be here. Finally face-to-face. Good to see you, Actually get to see see the faces (laughs) and not just hear and try to catch... And, the reaction and, 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 now, on my, and the voices. Now you're disappointed that you got to see all the <laughs> see that, yeah. Our faces are made for radio. That's <laughs> TV yeah. 10. Mine too. How, how nice of Mike to shove cameras in all of our faces. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you're at the Democratic National Convention this week. You left before last night. As I think you were at the Jefferson County Fair. Yes, I was there Monday and Tuesday night. And uh, it's high energy. Um, uh, frankly, it surprised me. Uh, I'd never been to a convention before. I always had watched on on TV, and it took my wife with me, and she was really in, enjoying it. And what was, I have to say, uh, my first reaction on Monday night, and it continued through Tuesday night. We watched uh, night before last uh, uh, some of Governor Hulse's speech, but I said to my wife, I said. I, makes me proud to be an American it's Mm -hmm. just because I was seeing people from all over the country and I've met so many mayors in the 12 years that I've been mayor and uh, my wife said you know everybody but it's a it's a small group but it's spread out across the country and uh, it was it, it was quite an experience quite an experience let's talk about Steve Williams for governor Okay, let's talk about what a, what a Steve Williams cabinet would look like and what your priorities would be. If you're looking to see the path someone's going, it's, it's best to see the footsteps where they've been. And uh, the one thing, I don't know that I'm necessarily from a cabinet level uh, position, I'm going to have brilliant people around me. Um, what I found... And as as mayor, is that if you have really bright people around you, and I, and I'm have always made the case very simply this is that everything is out on the table. We've got to have a full, robust d- discussion, um, and don't hold back. Because I'm always I'm always saying is that uh, uh, tell us tell us what you're seeing or what you're hearing might be the fallback positions or some of the, some of the problems. And um, the few times that I've been surprised about some things, they said, why didn't you tell me about this? And this, this one fellow said, uh, uh, you, don't, uh, you, you don't take criticism very well. And I said, I have to hear the criticism and everybody has to come back to me. Um, and well, what we would end up finding is that uh, as you challenge everybody, uh, they come up with innovative ideas, and it's amazing. You get a bunch of bright people around the table. It's amazing uh, just how brilliant the ideas that come out. And as a result, we've had some pretty heavy and distinctive problems that we've had to deal with, just as the state of West Virginia does. If you have bright people around, I don't want a bunch of yes people. I need somebody. I need them to be independent thinkers, um, uh, critical thinkers, and by doing by doing that, then we will work our way through. But there is also one other uh, standard that we have. Once we make a decision, you're all in. And uh, if you can't be all in, then you don't have an, you you don't need to be a part of the team. And uh, we've. Can you give I, I, can you give us an example, Steve, of a problem in Huntington that you you got some people together, and you solved? We didn't solve it. The opioid epidemic was a major part of it. When we first started dealing with with that, I, shoot, I, my background's in finance. It wasn't in law enforcement. And in my mind, in my mind, uh, uh, the police wouldn't be able to take care of everything. Uh, and particularly on this, this was a policing issue. And uh, I was having people who were coming to me on the street, at church, at the grocery store. Mayor, we don't feel safe in our city. We don't feel safe letting our kids out to, to, to play. And I thought, well, how can this be? We've got a strong police d- department. And uh, as it continued on, it, 
I was really realizing there's something else that's going going on here, and I went on a raid. Uh, had never been with the, the police department while they were doing that, but they told me their 500 grams of heroin had been distributed the night before that we. Uh, knew where it was in the drug house, and we were going to raid that the next morning and be able to get that off the street. And we went in. My heart was up in my throat because I knew our police officers were in harm's way. We went in and hit the house. Uh, nobody was in the house, um, but there was only 35 grams of heroin left. 465 grams of heroin had been distributed overnight. Well, I started bringing my team t together. Uh, wasn't I said this isn't just a policing problem. I came to understand at that point you can't arrest your way out of this. We have to be doing some some more. Well, I didn't just bring my team together. I brought people from the university, brought people from the hospitals. I brought other people within within the community. And what we did is started bringing folks together to ha be having conversations. And the whole idea that that developed out of, out of this is that uh, we could do some things locally in Huntington that other larger communities couldn't do. Uh, and the fact is in West Virginia, we can do things that other big states can't do because we're smaller. And it's not like the big ship that has to gradually move. You can move on a dime. We can identify sooner what works, quicker what doesn't, and faster how to fix it. And don't worry about making a mistake or, or having something that has to be adjusted once again we can we can do it much quicker and make make the make the adjustments well we ended up creating an office of drug control policy i i brought someone in from the the police department who was a, a statistician that that kept all our data i had a, a deputy fire chief uh, who eventually became my fire chief her name was jan, jan raider and she was also a nurse and uh, she was dialed in when she wasn't uh, on the job as a firefighter. She worked in the emergency room of one of the hospitals, and she was seeing what was going on. Uh, and then I had a, a retired police officer that was working with me, and uh, we pulled them together, and then we would be communicating with others. We started reaching out into the community, and we'd have groups of five or six individuals sitting around the table, and then we started, we had clergy, we had uh, uh, medical personnel, uh, we had the school system, uh, business leaders, uh, everybody around the table offering, uh, offering ideas. Well, one of the first things that came up was, and scared the living daylights out of me, a recommendation of having a harm reduction program, a needle exchange program. Well, as you said, I, I was going. My God, no! We don't start with that. You know, we do not. We do not start with that. But they started showing me the data that was how you were able to make sure that uh, you weren't having an HIV uh, outbreak and such, and that as a result of the health department having something like that, individuals would come in and be in in a better position of being referred to. Uh, into treatment programs and such. Well, we put together a strategic plan and they were going to be leading with that. And I said, for God's sakes, don't go leading with that. And as we were, as we were talking, I said, well, don't, don't end with it. I don't want to be the first thing they hear and I don't want it to be the last thing they hear. Bury it right there in the middle. Well, as they were going through talking about what we would be doing, being able to make sure that we had data, that we'd be up to date with what things, because the problem that we were seeing with the CDC, if you were taking the data from West Virginia or from Huntington, from the CDC, it was two years old. It was two years old. That's like going to a ball game, in, in a baseball game, the pitcher throws the pitch and then you swing two or three innings later you're always going to be missing missing the mark well what we ended up doing going around the the uh the city talking to people laying out uh the ideas that have been set and what shocked us is that in the churches among the businesses uh, uh in the hospitals saying you've got to start with the syringe exchange program 
be able to start that harm reduction program. And we started doing that. We got uh, uh, naloxone to be distributed to all of our first uh, responders. What we ended up finding is that as we started, there was, and we're still having, having this, uh, the opioid epidemic is always evolving. What was heroin in 2014 is fentanyl now, and it's in, in, it's in every, everything. Um, and what we're seeing in evolution of the recovery houses, honestly, uh, the sober living houses are, uh, can be a wonderful help to individuals, but what I have observed is that there are some that are, have another addiction to money and they are pursuing it only to make money and they have flop houses and they just throw the, the uh, uh, mattresses down. As a result of that, what uh, we have done is that the only way somebody can have a sober living house or a treatment facility has to have my signature. We've got to go through everything so that our inspectors go in and look at the house and look at the facility and make sure that it's up to code. Um, and we've had some that have sued us and uh, about this, and we've we've come to an accommodation, but we were able to accomplish what we have. But we've also seen that there are some who are crooks, and uh, the U.S. attorney is going after them. Um, but the way all of this has been able to to come together is you get brilliant people around you. Uh, we cr we ended up finding I had police officers and firefighters that. Uh, what they were seeing was just something that none of us would ever, ever be able to, to get out of our mind and started seeing attempted suicides, some suicides. And we think we've got, we have, as much as we have to be able to protect the community, we've got to make sure that our helpers receive help. And as we were sitting around the table, uh, one of our young folks saw something that uh, read an article about compassion fatigue. We were hearing from some of our first responders the same, well, just let them die because they were seeing the same people overdosing time, just let them die. Well, these individuals went into law enforcement, into the fire service to try to help people. Um, as a result, what we ended up put in, putting together was a, a program where we call the COMPASS program it was a wellness program for our police officers and, and firefighters, the first of its kind in, in the nation, where we were bringing ourselves uh, to, together, working with the university, working with the hospitals. Uh, we hired behavioral health uh, 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 counselors to, to, be, to be with us. We have built a wellness uh, program where, and a, a a fitness, uh, mm -hmm. a fitness uh, uh, program, center? a fitness program, fitness center, and we bought specific uh, equipment for individuals so they for for workouts that firefighters have to have for their specific uh, responsibilities. Same for for police. Um, and what we ended up doing, we we've got millions of dollars of grants. Uh, from the Bloomberg Foundation, the uh, uh, and several other, the Palatine Sisters and, and others, and we built that fitness center. Um, but we have a program in place. It's now 75 percent, 80 percent of our first responders are participating in this. We had individuals saying, "Well, why don't you just let them go work out at the y YMCA?" We don't have the proper equipment that firefighters need to be able for, for their specific need. So all of this is as you start, what we ended up finding is that we were being innovative in a, a way that people were wondering, how in the world is a small town like Huntington being able to, to, do, to do this? We started finding talent hiding in plain sight. Now, all of this goes to with the issues that we're dealing with, whether it's opioids, um, infrastructure, totally different. Mm -hmm. um, you have individuals sitting around the table. Well, as we started out with, what's the cabinet uh, going to lo look like? It's going to be a, col uh, a collaborative group 
that uh, you're laying everything out on the table and uh, there's not any one necessary, necessarily uh, uh, one area of, uh, it's, when you have policing, you're not going to just have all police officers around you. You're going to also have other individuals who want the business community to be. Well diversified table. Yes, yeah. yes. Bill? Yeah, on November the 5th, uh, the folks in West Virginia are going to select between you and Patrick Marcy. Uh, what's the difference between your platform and equally important, your implementation of your ideas between you and Patrick Marcy? Both of you are very successful. He's very successful in suing people. I'm very successful in running things. Um, we have issues in, in West Virginia where we're ranked 50th in infrastructure, 50th in healthcare, uh, uh, 47th in uh, business development. When we start looking at that, I've had to deal with that in Huntington. We were ranked 50th, we were ranked the most obese, most uh, unhealthy city in, in the nation. Well, we addressed that as I have spent much longer than uh, we expected on opioids. Um, we had a lagging economy. I had a, uh, I had a city that was nearly bankrupt. Um, the difference between my opponent and, and me is that I have run it and going in day one, I'm going to be dealing certainly the, a much larger, uh, uh, much larger budget, much, much larger issues. Uh, but uh, I learned when I was in 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 business that the difference between a small transaction and a large transaction, nothing but zeros, nothing but zeros. The fundamentals are are still the, the same. Um, what we're dealing with, interestingly enough, with what we were doing with the uh, opioid epidemic, they have now at the state level, they have an Office of Drug Control Policy patterned after what we were doing in, in Huntington. Uh, what we've learned to do in Huntington is build programs that can be replicated elsewhere, not necessarily having a statewide program because all of a sudden that ends up being somewhat clumsy, you need it to be reflective of what's happening at the at the local level. So the difference between my opponent and me, very simply, is is that I've done it. Um, I know how to collaborate and draw other people together. I'm not trying to drive people apart. Anybody who has talked in, about working with me, they have seen that. What I do is I gather folks t together and encourage them to collaborate. For the ones who are just wanting to point the finger and do jabs and, and, el and throwing the elbows, they're not going to want to work with me anyway, and they're not going to get anything done. Education is one of the biggest issues here oh, in West yeah. Virginia. If you're governor, how do you, where do you start chipping at it? How do you start improving this? About two minutes for the answer, Steve. <laughs> You've learned. Big subject, uh, only yeah. two minutes left. It is, yeah. Um, very simply, is it? It's it's not it's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, the key is is that uh, we've got public education needs to have the dollars that are going to it. A lot of money. I see that it's privatizing public education, and I just uh, see that that's a a distinct problem. I understand the need for um, private education and doing that, but we've got to make sure that we have the resources uh, to take care on a public education standpoint, on a higher education. It's even more important. The reason that we've had the difficulties uh, that we've had with high uh, uh, tuition and people have gone into debt and everything is that over the years, uh, they've because federal and state dollars have started to reduce on uh, going to higher education, the way they covered it is by increasing the, the tuition. Frankly, from a co collegiate standpoint, uh, I'll be looking to, for those who don't have the, the resources, I'll be looking for a, a plan in place so that uh, they can still go to college and either go to college for free or make sure that, uh, that there are grants and there, there's <laughs> sufficient support to make sure that everybody has that opportunity. Um, but 
to live in the digital age, you don't necessarily have to have a college degree, but you need to be educated and you need to be trained and we need to have workforce development and education, public education, uh, K through 12 and higher education, community colleges and beyond that, we have to be able to respond accordingly. Steve, where are you headed the rest of the day today? I've got, uh, I'm going through uh, uh, the town to be introduced to some folks this morning and then at noon uh, we've got a, a, a luncheon fundraiser for me at Alfredo's. Are you hanging Charleston. out with Kevin Knowles at all today? Um, he's over in Pittsburgh Oh, okay. uh, and uh, we're not going to be t together but we were. It wasn't my turn to watch him so yeah, I didn't know. We, we've been friends for, for some time um, and, uh, and Andy Blake and yeah. the city manager and I've worked well together as well. Good to see you, Steve. Thank you for, Thank you for stopping for, by. Thanks for and I, and thanks for keeping me on the two minute <laughs> on the two minute warning. <laughs> Steve Williams, mayor of Huntington and candidate for governor.